Wait, you made an economic theory into a board game. Hi there, I'm Peyton Dixon of Historic Experience, and this is What the History? The missing game piece, because if I can't play the orange guy, then I don't want to play. Hidden under that weird plasticky insert of history. So in the varied history of... I'm bored! What are we going to do today? The game has had a wide variety of options, ranging from amusing to awesome, from simple to inexplicable. And while one cannot overvalue the joy of a hoop being spun by a stick, or perhaps the Jacob's Ladder, <laughs> there has been a particular thrill with the tabletop game, uh, particularly when rain and mud made the spinning that hoop less practical. Sure, there's card games and dice games, though certain folks thought that sort of thing as... Uh, so Colonial Yahtzee wasn't exactly jumping off the sundry store shelves. Of course, a number of tabletop games in early America were often tavern games, including such hits as Shut the Box, which is more fun than it sounds, Fox and Geese, which is slightly less fun than it sounds, and Nine Men's Morris, which I guess depends on how you feel about Morris. However, the board game started taking off a bit with the Game of Life. No, not, not this Game of Life. This Game of Life. The new Game of Human Life, a British version of a French version of the game. Like the Game of Life you probably know, it also has a spinner that moves you through the course of life. However, the 20th century version gives you options like night school and life insurance, where the 18th century version gives you options like becoming a married man and immediately advancing to fatherhood, or land on the drunkard space and immediately get sent back to the infant space, because, you know, apparently they're not that different. Anywho, let's fast forward to that early 20th century, where a game came out where the object of the game is to obtain as much wealth or money as possible. The player having the greatest amount of wealth at the end of the game, after a certain predetermined number of circuits of the board have been made, being the winner. There's property purchasing, railroads, taxes, and jail. Peyton, you may be thinking to yourself, are you talking about the board game Monopoly? To which I would say yes! And no. The story that a lot of people, including Parker Brothers, the longtime game manufacturer, and the current owner of Monopoly, Hasbro, tell, is that Charles Darrow, an in-between jobs fellow from Philadelphia, had a vision of a board game. He crafted it out of the oil cloth on his dining table, borrowed charms and knickknacks for game pieces, carved houses and hotels from scrap wood with his own hands, and made a game of property and purchasing. He'd named the properties using Atlantic City streets and created this little gem of a game. But when he tried to market it to Parker Brothers, they laughed him out of the room because of at least 52 errors, including the game's length and complexity. But undaunted, Charles Darrow picked himself up from the dirt. If I have to lie, steal, cheat, or kill, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. Then he went off and sold 5,000 copies of the game on his own, and two years later, when demand was outpacing supply, Darrow went back to Parker Brothers, and this time, well, the rest is history. Not so fast. Some of these pieces are true, but there's a little side street off of Pacific Avenue that takes this story in a different direction. Walk with me down the Marvin Gardens path. Permit me to introduce you to one Lizzie Maggie, political activist, actress, poet, game designer. Among her progressive influences and ideals was a little maxim called Georgism, or the philosophies of Henry George, what are the odds, author of, among other things, Progress and Poverty. In it, George posits that poverty is directly related to technological and even social progress. Because advancements need land, and that land increases in value, and those who own the land can charge more, and thusly increase people's inability to live there, leading to poverty. Fun! 
One of his solutions was a more social, single land tax, so that everybody paid into the common good and people didn't just profit off the land that was valuable because of other people's efforts. Lizzie Maggie was deeply invested in this and wanted to spread the Georgie gospel. But as an actor, she knew it's a good idea, but it's just not sexy enough. So to get the idea out to the masses, she took to the increasingly popular world of board games. In the early 1900s, Maggie created, and then patented, the Landlord's Game, complete with four corner tiles, railroads, properties for snatching up, all the monopolistic tropes you know and love, or hate if you're a waterworks half full or half empty kind of person. And in the rules of play, the aim is to earn money, buy up all the properties, bankrupt your friends, and rule the board! <laughs> there's a second set of rules. If the players wish to prove how the application of the single tax would benefit everybody by equalizing opportunities and raising wages. Maggie would like to show you that this is the way. Instead of bilking your fellow players for all they've got, <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. According to the rules, the single tax is something everybody pays into, but there are no taxes on absolute necessities. And there's even a free college! You build up the land, and everybody in the game benefits. It's a sort of morality play meets economic theory, all wrapped up in a board game. Sexy! And it did well! It did so well that it didn't do well for Maggie. Although she wasn't directly selling it or marketing it, she mainly wanted to get the idea of single tax out there. Between some lax intellectual property enforcement and rather innovative everyday people, the Landlord's Game sort of moved around and morphed and made its way into people's homes under all sorts of names. Finance. Auction. Parker Brothers was even trying to put one together called fortune. And a variation of the game was popular with a Quaker community in Atlantic City who simply called it the Monopoly game. And one day, a transplant to Philly, Chuck Todd, no, not that Chuck Todd, the Quaker Chuck Todd. All right, fine. He introduced the game variation with the Atlantic City street names to his struggling neighbor, Charles Darrow. And now, the rest is history. Well, almost. A couple years later, possibly to wrap up loose ends, Parker Brothers officially bought the patent to the Landlord's Game from Lizzie Maggie for $500. She had hopes the game would bring more attention to the Georgist principles she believed in and maybe sell more games later. But Landlord got a very brief run and then was permanently shelved. And those anti-monopoly rules that could have made today's monopoly less cutthroat disappeared along with it. Actually, the main reason we know about most of this is because an economics professor named Ralph Anspach, Ralph Anspach? Ralph Anspach, dissatisfied with the pro-monopolizing impression the game gave, created his own counterboard, anti-monopoly. And in a 10-year lawsuit over the rights, Anspach uncovered and brought Maggie's story to light. And that's the story behind Monopoly. Thanks for taking a chance on me. Whether this is your first or hundredth time here, I appreciate you just visiting. I'm just glad I could get this off my community chest. Like, subscribe, let me know what you think. And remember, if you learn from history, you can make better history.